But uh, there's an overview of everything we've been saying so far. All right, so you inspire oxygen, you, you, O2 comes in, right? So that's your uh, PiO2, your inhaled oxygen, right? How much oxygen you're actually getting. Right. And again, that's the partial pressure, right? It's just a percentage, right? Oxygen is how much percentage of, of air? It's about 20%, right? So 20% of 760 is about 150. So that's how much oxygen you're inhaling. 150 millimeters of mercury of oxygen is getting into your alveoli, right? And if you're in Mount Everest, which has 200, right, uh, pressure, right? There's less pressure as you get higher in the atmosphere. It's 20% of that, right? Which is 40. So instead of inhaling 150 of oxygen, you're inhaling 40 of oxygen. Right, so the higher you go, right? Here in the Yano Valley, we're 698, so compared to 760, so we inhale a little less oxygen. Those guys down down, down below, that's why they call us a little bit loopy up here. Anyways, so yeah, so we have a uh, you know we that's inhaled oxygen that's going to come into our lungs, right? And then there could be lung issues. There could be a reason why we don't bring up the oxygen that's in our alveoli. Why is this 100 and that was 150? Because there's dead space in there, right? There's dead space inside the uh, uh, bronchioles and the trachea that don't exchange oxygen, right? The O2 is kind of stagnant and the O2 kind of, you know, the, our, then our bloodstream will kind of pick it up. But also the CO2 is stagnant and it's dead space that's always there. And well, uh, how much CO2 do you inhale? Why, why is it, is it 40 that inhale? No, you inhale 0.3, right? So if you look at 0 .0, sorry, 0 0.03 percent of the atmosphere is CO2, right? So the most of the atmosphere is nitrogen, 79.7 percent, but 20 percent is oxygen. The other 0 0.03 percent is your, um, I think it's 0.3. I don't know. Anyways, that's your that, that is your CO2, right? So that's going to then get in here. It gets stale, 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 and it's going to kind of equilibrate to 40. 40 is normal, right? And of course, you can exhale this 40 and it's going to come out and you're going to be able to pick that up on your end tidal CO2 monitor. And we'll talk about end tidal CO2 in our next lecture, but end tidal CO2 is important because if this 40 gets to 42, 44, 48, why is it going out? So maybe they're not ventilating, right? They're hypoventilating. That could be why your CO2 is going up because the CO2 is staying behind, right? It restorates 18, you know, 12 to 20, the rest rates four to eight. They're not, you're not, the CO2 is going to start to be able to build up and that's going to be, be able to be detected on the end tidal CO2. Okay. So if you're, see, if you're breathing really fast, right, you're ventilating really fast, you're blowing off more CO2. And yeah, you're, you're going to see that trend. The first it's 40, then it's 35, then it's 30. You can see that in real time on the end tidal CO2. Okay. But going back to inhale, do you inhale? right? And you exhale. So all the air comes into your lungs, into your, down into your alveoli, and eventually everything, again, everything in the universe goes high to low, right? So we have to think, start the, the story somewhere. Like where do the chicken or egg start from? Let's just start from the venous side, right? We know that our tissues absorb oxygen, right? And they then deposit CO2. Why do we know that? Because this fancy formula right here called cell respiration, our second favorite form, formula besides the O2 hemoglobin dissociation curve, right, is cell respiration and glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and the cytochrome system, right? All those things are the whole purpose of oxygen in the universe is just to be split in half and absorb a hydrogen molecule, two of them, right? So then that two hydrogen molecules and half an oxygen is H2O, right? So you, oxygen comes into the equation right here and you punch out six waters, right? Also part of cell respiration is CO2 does get produced. So CO2 is going to come its, and make its way to our, um, our normal PaCO2. Normal PaCO2 is 35 to 45. So just say 40, right? Call it even. Our tissues are producing CO2 and it's going to go from high to low, from tissues to blood. That's what we want to happen, right? We want to get rid of this waste product. We know when CO2 starts rising and rising and rising, that can cause problems, as we'll talk about in the ABG section. Okay, so then I got PO2, right? PO2 is 100, it's gonna to go to my tissues, right? They're starving, they're, they're using oxygen, right? They use the six oxygen right here. They're gonna use that oxygen and they're going to, you know, and then the hemoglobin is be happy to dissociate it, especially the tissues that require more, right? And then we're now we're back into the venous system, right? And these are our VBGs, which we'll touch on in the ABG section. So those numbers might look a little foreign to you. We're usually used to the ABG numbers. But VBGs are valid. They are something you can look at as well to assess really your CO2 and pH. It's not really great for oxygen. But anyways, we've got now we're down to 40 on our oxygen levels and we're up to 46 on our 
CO2 levels, right? So now we're back at the alveolus, right? So we inhaled oxygen, hopefully we exhaled CO2 so that we exhale enough CO2 to get to nice, comfortable 40. And now the 46 will then go into the tissues, into, sorry, into the alveolus, and we'll be able to exhale our CO2. And then the alveolus has 100 just waiting for the blood being delivered by the right ventricle to then, you know, bring this 40 up to a cool 100, right? Things always go from high to low, right? It diffuses up to a, a match, right? It's not gonna go higher than 100, right? Unless you have a lot of higher FiO2, then you'll have, you'll get more, right? So yeah, so we bring that uh, O2 up to 100, which is what we expect. 80 to 100 is our normal uh, PO2. And our CO2 is going to drop back down to its normal value, 35 to 45, right? And our saturations, of course, will be around 95% as well. And then we're back to over here, where we have to, where we are going to deposit that at the tissues, right? We can have VQ mismatches up top, where we're going to get hypoxic because we're not delivering enough oxygen, whether it be a low VQ or a high VQ, right? There can be um, there's AA gradients that get in the way and cause us to be hypoxic, right? If we have a problem here. Right, we got a uh, a restrictive disease, an interstitial lung disease, or long COVID, or scarring that can cause a, a problem of getting O2 and CO2 across that membrane. Right, or we have pulmonary hypertension, which can make it difficult to get blood to the lungs. Or we have a PE can cause uh, problems as well. Right, that's Morgan VQ, but specifically AA is there is a issue getting O2 down into the alveoli, and the alve that O2 starts getting lower and lower and lower. Instead of going 100 to 40, it can be 80 to 40. And now my PO2 is 80. Well, that's passable, but what if it gets down to 60 or 50, right? Because of a VQ mismatch of some sort, right? So that big A is your alveolar O2, and that can, be, that can start dropping when there's lung issues that, that are happening, right? And now the oxygen is there, hopefully, and now we have to deliver it, right? We have to deliver it to the tissues. We know that it's ready to go. It's, it's primed up and ready to be taken to the tissues. As long as I have enough hemoglobin, right? My hemoglobin's five versus 15, I'm gonna deliver less oxygen to the tissues. And then my cardiac output, right, is not that great. That's gonna be interrupting my DO2. So the cardiac output being, being bad, hemoglobin being bad, can cause my delivery of oxygen to be poor. Saturation is not great. I could have hemoglobin issues like sickle cell disease. That can make it difficult for me, my hemoglobin to get saturated, right? And then PO2, right? The PO2 would be low probably because of, a, again, a VQ mismatch or an A gradient that starts getting widened, okay? And then we have a PF ratio, which we'll have a slide on. And then finally, we get down to the, the lung, to the, sorry, the tissues. We've delivered the oxygen to the tissues, and now the tissues, we say they're going over, over time, and they're really cranking, and their volume of oxygen is being, is really, really going, right? What's, what increases VO2? What's something that might make our tissues demand more oxygen? Sepsis can do it. Sepsis is going to start, you know, triggering the tissues to be hyperdynamic and use a lot of oxygen. And something like fever can do it, right? Like inflammation, sepsis. We have seizure activity. We have um, agitation, pain. All these things increase the oxygen demand of the tissues. And when that is greater than the delivery of oxygen, that's when you have patients that come to the hospital and even in the ICU. Okay. You can measure the extraction ratio. That's just a percentage of how much was delivered versus how much came out. It's not as, as important as, you know, our delivery of oxygen, the ABG, that tells us what is going on in the blood, right? And there is, you can measure SVO2 and mixed venous oxygens. There's a, there's a whole ethical com complaint about SCVO2, as I think we'll talk about in hemodynamics. Some guy is like, oh, look at this, SVO2s, and I got a special central line that measures SCVO2s. You got to do it. The research is great. And the research was f was fraud, and then he sold more central lines because of it. It's a whole thing. And now everybody boluses CVPs up to 8 to 12 because of him, and it was all false research. as a whole thing. So, And a lot of patients suffered because of that. So that's why you don't trust CVP for, for volume resuscitation. You don't trust SCVO2s for, to, for a target SAT, right? That's, so it's, it's a whole thing involved with that. We'll talk about that more in hemodynamics. Okay, so yeah, that's our kind of our overview of what we've been talking about, right? So respiration, again, you inhale, alveolus are gonna exchange oxygen with the uh, blood, with the blood being delivered to it via the pulmonary artery, and then you're gonna go into the, into the arterial system delivers it to the tissues, and the tissues are going to exchange its O2 and CO2, and it's going to use the oxygen and cell respiration down there. It's going to pump, pump out CO2 and, and water via cell respiration, 
and then it's going to make its way to the venous blood all the way back up to the alveoli. Okay, so again, the AA gradient. The AA gradient is, um, it's only really useful to see if someone has disease or not disease. Does someone have a pneumonia or a PE or a uh, pneumothorax or something going on, or do they not? So that's really the only usefulness out of AA gradients, right? It tells you if there's a lung process or not, right? All it's doing is say you take, you calculate the PO2, which takes effort, and then you then calculate, or then you measure the P little AO2, which is your ABG, right? That's your little ABG right there. You look at the difference, right? Normal is about 10, and if it's more than that, then there's there, there's an issue, right? but it's actually age-based. So if you know pediatrics and you know about ET tube sizes, it's the same formula. It's your age in years divided by four plus four, right? So if they are 80 years old, right? 80 divided by four is 20, right? Plus four is 24. If they're 16 years old, 16 divided by four is four, right? Plus four is eight, right? So for a 16 year old, eight is a, a good AA gradient. That's how much diffusion restriction there should be. That's how much effort there is between the alveolus and the arterial bloodstream, right? So that's the normal AA gradient. And again, it goes up with age, right? It looks as like there's something in the way of gas exchange, edema, pus, something vascular going on, right? It's very nonspecific. You can't really use it when the CO2 is high. It only tells you that you have what's called alveolar hypoventilation, which means you didn't get enough oxygen to the alveolus because you weren't ventilating, right? Because you weren't breathing, you were hypoventilating, okay? So normal gradient, you'll see a normal AA gradient in hypoventilation, right? So you say, oh shoot, the PO2 is 40 because they weren't breathing. Or were they were not breathing because they all of a sudden had a, a PE? Did they fall over and have a PE? Or did they fall over because they had orthostatic hypotension and, they, and that's why they, they're breathing shallow right now, right? So that's really the only, kind of uh, usefulness of this. The other usefulness is if you can assess someone on Mount Everest, right? You can say, hey, the FIO2, they, they don't have anything wrong with their lungs. They just went to Mount Everest. They were very, very motivated because every dead body on Mount Everest was a very motivated person <laughs> at one point, right? So that's a uh, that's what you're looking at. Is, is, is there a problem with the lungs or not? Because if you have a raised AA gradient, right? That means my PO2 is low and I have my PO2 is suffering too. There's something in the way. There's an edema, an effusion, there's an infiltrates that are going on, right? There can be shunts, there can be dead space, there's something happening in the, in the lungs. It doesn't really tell us which one. All it tells us is were they hypoventilating or not, okay? So to calculate it, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because this is something you just punch into the uh, it's MD calc. You can just go in there, you can punch the numbers in and it gives it to you. There's no reason to memorize this or to, you know, it's just it's something you can look at and say, oh shoot, the A gradient is this after you get your number out. And once that number is out, you can say, is this normal for this person or not, right? If it's normal for a, you know, 16 year olds, that's, that's fine, right? But it might not be normal. So we got, we got to compare it. Okay, so what do you need for PO2? What do you have to punch in the computer? You have to punch in how much FiO2 they're getting, what the atmospheric pressure is, you know, 760 in Venice Beach, up here at 698, and at Mount Everest, 200, right? So we have, and then we have the partial pressure of water or water vapor, and that's usually just a, a fixed number of 47, right? Like how much, what's the water vapor the patient is, is exhaling at any one time? But if someone has a fever, you are producing more water, right? Your cell respiration process is going more and more. So the, when your RT does an ABG for you, you gotta tell them what the temperature is also. Cause that's gonna change the movement of O2 and CO2 and the movement of, of uh, well, gases. And also it's gonna change this formula here too, okay? And they have to get a CO2 as well. So you get your CO2 from ABG, your O2 from the ABG, how much FiO2 is the patient getting? And also respiratory quotient. So respiratory quotient is just assumed. It's 0.8, right? So that's something that uh, the, the, rest, the nutrition guy came to me and says, hey, we can, can we plug this into your ventilator? It costs $7,000. We can, we can really measure the respiratory quotients. And I was trying to think of the kind of utility of it. And yeah, you do want to sometimes drive it down sometimes, but uh, that's on the next slide about why it'd be useful to do that. And why, like some patients, you don't want a higher PaCO2 or a higher respiratory quotient, I should say. Okay. All right. So FiO2. So we just plug these into this formula here in green is normal, right? So altitude can change 760 and fever can change your water vapor. 
0.8 is your respiratory quotient. That doesn't usually change, all right, unless you can actually measure it. And usually in real life, where would you measure respiratory quotient? It'd be like at a sports medicine facility. They, they can measure respiratory quotient. They put you in a big bubble and they measure how much, you know, how much uh, calories you're, you're burning at a certain period of time. Okay, but yeah, so we punch in the FiO2. So we put a normal FiO2 of 21%, which is room air, and we punch in a normal PaSO2 of 40. We get a PaO2 of 99, or 100, remember, is our normal PaO2. And we take our normal uh, arterial oxygen, so let's just say 90, right? That's 9. Well, what's normal? Depends on their age, but 10, 9 is definitely normal, and 8 is normal for a 16 year old. So as long as you're not 16, or like if they're 18, you've, you've, you've passed, right? But if you're hypoventilating, right, this is the utility of an AA gradient. You know, right, they're on room air, 21%, right? And at the, at the time they did the ABG, they were on room air, and they did a PACO2, and they said PAC2 was elevated because you're not blowing it off because you're hypoventilating of 60, right? Punch 60 in there, punch in the formula, you get 75, right? And you take their PO2, and the PO2 is, is going to be low or high when you're hypoventilating. You're not taking oxygen into your lungs. Are you, is your PO2 going to be high or low? It's going to be low, right? So let's give, let's give a low number of 50, right? 75 minus 50, 25, right? So we got a 25. Is that normal for a 40-year-old? 25. So how do you calculate an AA gradient? Or a uh, normal AA gradient is the age divided by 4 plus 4. So 40 divided by 4 is 10 plus 4, 14. So it's 25. So that means the AA gradient is not okay, right? So that's, that tells you there's a, there's a problem with hyperventilation. If you have lung pathology, you have a pneumonia or something like that, that's where you can, you got a PO2, you got like 100% oxygen, right? 1.0, you got CO2, they're probably breathing pretty fast at 30, and you get 675. Well, shoot, 675 is a lot, right? So uh, because I'm delivering 100% oxygen into those alveolus, I'm going to have a really, really high alveolar oxygen concentration, right? And I subtract their um, PO2, right? What is the ABG PO2? Let's just say 60. You can say 50 for you want, if you want. 670 minus 60 is 600. Is 600 normal? You have to be like 1,200 years old for that to, for, for that to matter, right? So that's definitely, you've got something wrong with your lungs, right? Whereas 25, is that okay for a 40-year-old? Not so much, but okay for a 60-year-old, 80-year-olds? You know, yeah, like they're just hypoventilating, okay? So that's the utility of it. And over here, we talk about why, you know, CO2 retainers use is not, not applicable. Because if someone just sits at a CO2 of 70, right, and they're on room air, 21%, you get a number of negative 17. It's like, what does negative 17 A gradient mean? So it's not useful for someone that is a CO2 retainer, okay? All right, so PF ratio is usually the one we use in place of the AA gradient because the AA gradient is a little annoying. So the PF ratio is our poor man's AA gradient. So we just quickly say, oh, that's what, that's what there's something in the way, right? Or there's not something in the way, okay? So normal PF ratio is greater than 300, and how do you get that? It's literally PF. So P divided by F, or PAO2 divided by the FiO2, right? You just divide them. So what's your PO2? 80 to 100, right? So let's say 80 and divided by my FiO2. How much FiO2 am I getting? Let's say room air, right? So if my P room air, right, let's say 40%, because I didn't put, I didn't go that low, right? Your 40%, oh, sorry, over here, my fault. Your PO2 is, uh, what did I say, 80, right? And we're on room air, that is put it there. That's 381 if I divide those two, right? But if I'm on 80%, um, or I have an 80 PO2, and I'm on 100% oxygen, right? 80 divided by one, you have to make sure you remember that it's a percent. So 100% is one, 50% is 0.5, right? So 80 divided by, if I got PO2 of 80, perfect, right? 80 to 100 is great. Aaron told me that's 80 is great, right? And more than 60, but they require 100% oxygen to achieve that. That PF ratio is 80, that's not good, right? If they're, PF, if they're on room air and PO2 of 80, perfect, right? If they're on 50% oxygen, right? They're on like a simple mask, and that's like 200 or you know 160. That's not decent. They should be a lot higher, uh, you know, O2 level in their bloodstream, right? That means they got something going on in their lungs. Okay, and we can quantify that. So if it's less than 1, 200 or less than 100, we're in ARDS territory, acute respiratory distress syndrome, right? And if you're less than 100, that's actually a 45% mortality. That's not good to be at. Okay. 
and it only really risk stratifies. It's, it's if you're, hey, you have ARDS and your PF ratio is 220, or you have ARDS, your PF ratio is 80. One is much worse than the other. That's as far as mortality is concerned. It also can give us ball, ballparks as far as like when to do certain interventions. So your PF ratio less than 150. So who has who's less than 150? We're on 70% oxygen on the ventilator, and I'm on 70% FiO2. That's that's 100 PF ratio. And for less than 150, what's the time for? Proning. It's time to prone the patient on the ventilator. So 150 is usually our our uh, line in the sand where we decide whether to prone a patient or not. Okay. We can do other little things before that. We can do rotational therapy with our beds. We can you know mobilize to try to improve that as much as possible. And also we can reduce the FiO2. You know maybe they don't need. It's like I got 70% stats. I'm sorry, 70% like FiO2. But my stats are 99%. It's like well. Well, that's, this PF ratio doesn't know that what your saturation is. So we got to make sure we are getting it within what the target should be. It also does not account for PEEP, right? PEEP and FiO2 are two things that improve our oxygen. This is just looking at the FiO2 part, right? We got a little nef nefarious during COVID times where you got the PF ratio. It's like, what's the PF ratio? It's 151. Why is it 151? We're on 49% oxygen <laughs> and PEEP of eight. <laughs> So we were able to kind of fool the, fool the numbers because, you know, everybody was getting prone and some people really needed it and some people didn't. So then you got some intensivists came through, it was like prone, 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 prone. It's like, no, this one isn't either. One, PF ratio is 152. I don't have to tell you, right? So if your PF ratio is less than 50 though, it's pretty much time for ECMO therapy where you're, it's extracorporeal membrane oxygenation where we take all the blood from their body, oxygenate it in an artificial lung and put it back in, right? And it, there's all kinds of criteria for that as well. Okay, and again, PEEP does not, uh, is not accounted for. And when you have high PSO2, it's not accounting for that either. So there are some little caveats to it, but it, for the most part, it can give you a ballpark about how, how bad or how good they're doing, right? So you can say, hey, they came with a PF ratio of 87 on arrival. PF ratio today is, is you know, 280. So well, shoot, they're, they're getting better, right? And they should probably maybe can we consider coming down on the vent settings, coming down on the sedation, doing these other things to get them out of the ICU. Okay, so again, I'm not gonna spend time on this one too much, respiratory quotient, because there's not too too much applicability until we can actually measure respiratory quotient. Like in this picture, here's how we measure it, All right? It's just saying if I, you know, how much CO2 are you producing? That's all it's looking at, based on how much O2 you're consuming. Because if you are producing a lot of CO2, it's because you are going through the Krebs cycle and the glycolysis cycle from top to bottom. Right. So if you use glucose, and you put it through the Krebs cycle, you produce uh, three CO2s on this side and three on the other side, you get six CO2s out. That's six over six. Right. That's a one uh, restor quotient. But if you start mixing in fatty acids, right, from fats, you start mixing in proteins, you st it starts changing the values. Right. So there's the, the, the mechanics, the math kind of checks out where, you, you know, if you have like a COPD patient, do you want them to produce a lot of CO2? Probably not. So let's drive down the respiratory quotients a little bit less. So they're down to, you know, they're down to like 0.7, et cetera. So you get more high fat, fat diets for these guys instead of a pure glucose carbohydrate diet. Okay. That's the idea behind respiratory quotient is it's looking at what nutrients are you giving them. It's all the rage in the nutrition world. So they, they can then calculate the glucerna 1.2 versus glucerna 1.5 is like, which one? Just tell me, right? So one, I think 1.5 is calories. I want calories for my ICU patient, right? Say, well, no, the 1.2 has more protein content, so we want to do more protein to drive down the respiratory quotient, and that that'll help out your patient. So that's why they're useful in rounds. That's why they're useful to know these things about the patients. Okay. So yeah, so it's affected by you know how much O2 you're delivering. Right? Again, with no oxygen delivery, you're going to start doing anaerobic metabolism. You're going to start producing lactate. Right? Your mitochondria is what? powerhouse of the cell. It's also shuts down when there's no oxygen, right? And because it's a protective mechanism, because this cytochrome system here that makes, that takes the oxygen and makes it, and it grabs the extra hydrogen molecule, right? And makes water. Well, if there's no oxygen, you're going to build up hydrogen. You build up hydrogen, that's acid, and you're going to, all your cells are going to start dying. So we want to make sure we have oxygen. So it's a protective mechanism so that your cells don't die. So we make, we produce lactate in the meantime, and then we can use the lactate right over here. We can use lactate gets turned into pyruvate, lactate gets turned into pyruvate, and then we produce a whole bunch of CO2. 
right, without oxygen. So we're not really consuming oxygen. So the, the formula, we're not producing oxygen, we're just using CO2. Sorry, we're just using, we are producing CO2, but we're just using uh, lactate. And there's like 10 in this example, okay? All right, so variations. So COPD patients, you do want a high fat, low carb diet for this reason, because you're gonna drive down the CO2 production. If you're overfeeding a patient or underfeeding a patient, then you start causing mitochondrial dysfunction, and that can lead, lead to you know, anaerobic conditions, which is not good. And liver cirrhosis, it can tell you that they are, you know, they're getting worse over time because your liver stores glycogen, which is your pure glucose, right? So if, that's, if they are, have a low RQ, that means they're not really storing glucose. That's so a, a, uh, something they can use in the, in the outpatient setting. All right, so O2 toxicity, we touched on that uh, when you're more than uh, PO2 of what is concerning, can start causing problems. PO2 greater than 60. 80 to 100 is normal, so PO2 greater than 100 is start causing or start being concerned, right? And why would your PO2 greater than 100? It's because you're delivering too much FiO2, right? So we have the saturation to tell us if we're getting too high or not. Remember the 4, 5, 6, 79, right? So 90% is PO2 of 60. That's kind of where we should be, 80 to 92%. When we start getting higher than 95%, we can have higher PO2s and can lead to a lot more problems, right? So when you're definitely in 100% oxygen or more than 70% oxygen for more than 48 hours, that starts causing a lot of O2 toxicity because what's happened with hyperoxia, it starts degrading the mitochondria, starts stimulating nitric oxide breakdown, which creates free radicals here. It starts activating all kinds of other pathways and creates these free radicals, which are going, which are radically going to damage the tissues, right? Including the lungs, right? And that was our whole point was to oxygen the patient. And then we have start that oxygen itself starts damaging the lungs, right? Again, in COVID, that's what we saw a lot of is you guys were hundred percent oxygen for like a week in tele. And then they are, you know, then they start, they go come to ICU because their ARDS is much worse, right? So they can go into ARDS with O2 toxicity. And ironically, ARDS patients require a lot more FiO2. So how do we fix that? How else can you raise someone's oxygen levels if you can't give them too much FiO2? Bruno. PEEP, right? So FiO2 and PEEP are usually our two things we're gonna be uh, working with to bring someone's oxygen level up. And not to 80 to 100, but just 60, and that's all we need. And even our ARDS, it'll really sick as the sickest patients, we'll accept 50, right? That, that's okay, all right? As long as the oxygen is not more than 70%. That's kind of our goal, is always to get them down to at least 70% oxygen. All right, they shouldn't be, you shouldn't just have a patient 100% oxygen for like two shifts in a row, right? They should be, you gotta be figure out what else can we do? Because there is other things we can do. Mostly it's PEEP, but then we can say, well, let's try diuresis, let's try setting them up, let's try making sure they can, you know, they need a thoracentesis to take out some fluid. Maybe they have a huge ascites that we can tap, right? There are things we can do to, to fix the, um, the oxygen requirements, hopefully. Okay, so these reactive oxygen species or these free radicals are what are causing all the damage to the body, including the alveoli. Okay, causes chemical toxicity, which is ARDS, causes pulmonary damage, acidosis, etc. Causes kidney damage, causes hepatic damage, endocrine dis disruption, causes you know CNS disruption. They get start getting confused. You know, when people go to oxygen bars for too long, they start getting headaches. That's kind of a little, little precursor to what's, what's about to happen, right? And it starts breaking down the blood-brain barrier, starts breaking down uh, you know, cellular processes, you start getting more altered. It's a, it's a problem, okay? So we wanna make sure our oxygen levels are appropriate. Okay, and then our final piece of O2 tension indices are, are the O2 that's on our hemoglobin, right? So our hemoglobin picks up four molecules of oxygen, right? So it picks up four molecules of oxygen right here, and it's ready to drop off oxygen at the tissues. Does it drop off all four? No, because then that'd be a 0% saturation, right? So they, so four molecules is 100%, so they drop off one molecule, gets you to 75%, right? And we know that 75% um, sats, right? And a venous side, right? We got 75% is equivalent to a PO2 of about 46, right? Which is our normal, you know, P, our venous oxygenation, right? So in blue here is what you would see on a VBG. You see a 75% sat, and you see a, a venous O2, um, dissolved v O2 of about 75, uh, sorry, about uh, 40, 40 or less, right? 
So that makes sense, right? So how does the hemoglobin know which tissues to be need what? They are very smart about it. They know that when the tissue has really high temperature, it's going to deform more and just, and oxygen is going to be is going to leave a lot quicker compared to a tissue that is doesn't have a lot of uh, high temperature or a lot of acidosis or a lot of CO2. So it is it, it knows which tissues need oxygen, which tissues don't, right? So if you have like a tourniquet on your leg, it's going to deliver a lot more oxygen to that leg compared to the other leg, right? And it's, it's basically just about the denaturing of the protein about why it would dissolve oxygen or let go of oxygen more. And they call this O2 affinity, right? Affinity is how much you love something, right? So what is O2's affinity for hemoglobin? Does it love it or not love it, right? So over here, when they are, when they're in this uh, more critical situation where they need to drop off more hemoglobin, this curve is gonna shift to the right. They're going to drop off more oxygen compared to baseline, right? So if you kind of compare the numbers here, they're going to drop the PO2 at the tissues is going to be, or, you know, sorry, the tissues oxygen demand when it's much higher, you're going to have a lot more dropping off of oxygen, right? The O2 affinity will be um, less, right? It's not going to like hemoglobin as much anymore, right? And what makes hemoglobin, or what makes O2 not like hemoglobin even more is this chemical called 2,3-DPG, it's a protein. That uh, it's it's like you can think of as skunk farts, all right? So it's it's something that it it just hates it, right? It's not it says nope, I'm leaving, I'm out, right? I don't have any affinity for you anymore. I am leaving, right? And it's actually a protective mechanism. Your body will make more of this when your tissues need more. You, literally, your RBCs it'll make more DPG when it recognizes the tissues are in stress, right? And that will allow it to dump more oxygen off, right? But it's DPG, and you can kind of maybe guess what the P stands for. What do you think it stands for? stands for phosphate, right? So this is why we check phosphate levels on our patients to make sure the phosphate's good, right? So that they can they have adequate oxygen delivery to, our, to their tissues. Not only is phosphate used for energy for ATP, but it's also used to help oxygenate our tissues as well, right? To make sure the phosphate levels are good. Because if you don't have phosphate, you can't make ATP and you can't make 2,3-DPG, which our RBCs are, are making, okay? So O2 affinity to love for hemoglobin, affected by CO2. CO2 starts rising, it's going to leave the hemoglobin and drop itself off of the tissues that have high CO2. Same thing with pH. Yes, high CO2 will lower our pH, but pH independently will cause a drop in our, our, a drop in our affinity. It'll make us, our O2 uh, leave the hemoglobin and drop, make its way to the tissues, right? Unusual hemoglobins, yeah, that can happen. That's usually more uh, in, in pediatrics, they would recognize this. Right, but we sometimes see carboxyhemoglobin and CO poisoning, carbon monoxide. Right, and then temperature. Right, so temperature will be a uh, uh, temperature is elevated. That's going to make the oxygen leave and supply itself to those tissues that are, have a higher temperature. And then again, the concentration of 2,3-DPG. DPG is what makes oxygen not love the hemoglobin. Right, it will leave the hemoglobin when it's when it's uh, when it wants to. Now, the the critical thinking piece here is if I don't have a good phosphate then my 2,3-DPG can't be made. But my tissues want, they're, they're, they're febrile and they're acidotic and they're hypercaptic with a high CO2. It should be leaving the, the molecule, but it's not because I can't produce the 2,3-DPG. So that's something to, to consider is like, I need phosphate so I can help oxygen the tissues better, right? And again, 2,3-DPG is made when oxygen levels start getting lower and lower, okay? And the PO2 wise, right? And again, hemoglobin is never absolutely empty, otherwise it'd be 0% sat. So we never get to 0% sats. It's always somewhat saturated. It could be 75%, it could be 50% when you have a you know, really, really demanding uh, tissue, right? When tissue's oxygenation is really, really low, your hemoglobin is gonna drop off a lot more, right? All right, so O2 is going to be dropping off uh, O2, sorry, hemoglobin is gonna be dropping off O2, especially when the 2,3-DPG is being produced by the RBC. Okay, so this P50, I won't spend too much time on it because we ha don't have it just yet on our ABG machines. The ABG machine is what, which do is what does this, but this tells you that what is my uh, PO2 at 50% stats. So if I'm at 50% stats right here, right, sat is 50%, what is the P50? What is my, stat what is my PO2 at 50%? So it should be about 27. That's, that's what it should be. Now, if it's higher, that means I'm dumping off a lot of, uh, 
a lot of oxygen because I have a temperature, pH, CO2 elevation. That's the reason why. But if someone has a temperature and they have a low pH and they have elevated CO2, but the P50 is low, that means A, their phosphorus is low or they are not, you know, they're not able to make 2,3 DPG. When can you not make do cellular processes? When you have, you know, you have a um, you know, massive blood transfusions might do it because you're super acidotic now. You're diluting out the ability to make it. Uh, septic shock, you're depleting all your phosphorus. Uh, hypophosphatemia, again, you're depleting all phosphorus and that's going to make it so you can't make this important protein which lets you disassociate O2 from the hemoglobin molecule. Okay, so phosphate is required, yes, for ATP and energy. It's also required for, you know, for all these cell respiration cycles, which makes the ATP. It's required for these processes, CAMP and CGMP, for cell signaling and also for contractility of vessels and all, and all kinds of other fun stuff. And then again, DPG stands for diphosphoglycerate. So this is the importance of uh, providing phosphorus, right? It has a weak buffer capacity, but it's mostly for this. Okay, so that's the idea behind a, uh, the P50, right? It's what is the O2, what is the PO2 at 50% sets. Okay, so a summary of hypoxia, right? So the summary is, you know, how do you figure out why someone's hypoxic? Their PO2 is low. Well, why is it low? Well, maybe they didn't inhale enough O2. The inspired oxygen is low, right? Low inspired oxygen because they have a, uh, again, it could be a Mount Everest, like that could always happen, but also they could be, you know, they have a, uh, they are hypoventilating, right? They're not inspiring enough oxygen, okay? And also it could be um, more specifically, like a simple mask mentioned, uh, we mentioned earlier, less than six liters per minute, that's iatrogenic, right? Suffocation, that's where you are not providing enough oxygen or not enough washout, and they are going to not have enough inspired oxygen inside that mask on their face, right? It's not, not a high enough flow, right? Alveolar hypoventilation, that's where you are not delivering, you know, again, you're not, the O2 is fine, the room air is fine, but it's not getting its way all the way down to the alveoli. Okay, and it can be central or peripheral. It could be, it could, might, not, might not be ventilating, get that oxygen down to their, to their alveoli because they have a neuromuscular disorder. They have Guillain-Barre or they have myasthenia. They have, uh, you know, C345, the diaphragm is not alive. There's, these are things that would make them so they are not ventilating appropriately, right? Or they could just be getting tired. That could be a, a situation as well, okay? And then we have, uh, what else we have, and that, cause that can lead to uh, elevated pCO2 as well. All right, so then we have the AA gradient or PF ratio that is not not great, all right, and that's elevated. That means that we are with the AA gradient is elevated, the PF ratio is low. That means that we have a mismatch of some sort. There's a VQ mismatch. We have pneumonia. We have an embolism. We have edema. We have ARDS or cardiogenic shock. These are all the things that are getting in the way of oxygen making its way from the alveolus into the um, the bloodstream okay and we can get that from the abg we can get what the po2 is a little a and we can get what the fio2 is to get our poor man's a gradient or you can go through the formula and say oh yeah that's either normal meaning that there's not a for that person's age meaning that it wasn't a pneumonia or anything it was it's just not ventilating or it's abnormal and we got to do like an x-ray to figure out what's going on a ct angio to see what's going on we have to do more testing okay Anemic uh, is another issue that could be reason why I have poor DO2, poor delivery of oxygen to my um, to my tissues. That's why I'm hypoxic, right? There are you know other weird things like they have mitochondrial damage. Usually, a sepsis and SIRS will will do that. Will start damaging the mitochondria directly, and that can then lead to uh, inability of our tissues to even use the oxygen that you're giving them, right? So you can actually measure that and like with a SVO2 it actually starts going up. Right, the venous oxygen level goes up. Like, why are they going up? I thought they were like really sick. Why should, should they be using all the oxygen? Well, it's because the sepsis impairs the mitochondria from even using it in the first place. Right. All right. So yeah, VQ mismatch, and then shunt. We talked about dead space. We talked about, and then there's something wrong with the uh, alveolus being like scarred. Right. That's making it difficult for the oxygen CO2 to get across in the first place. Okay. So those are the issues that can happen with a um, or the things that can cause hypoxia. Okay, so the kind of switching gears just a little bit, just to not forget about uh, CO2, right? Hypercapnia, 
that's where you are have an elevated CO2. Hypercarbia may, might see it uh, listed as, or type 2 for CO2 respiratory failure, right? So it's either they won't breathe, they can't breathe, or they're just making extra CO2. It's not really their fault, right? So that'd be something like a, uh, like a fever or increased work of breathing, seizure might, might cause that. But usually they, they won't breathe, right? The rest rate's low, or they can't breathe. They can't get a good tidal volume, all right? It could be due to obesity. It could be due to a uh, positioning, right? You lay, lay a, a larger person flat. There's like, oh, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Sit me up, sit me up, sit me up. They might have large, large ascites that make it difficult for them to, uh, to take in an adequate tidal volume, right? So increased respiratory rate, or sorry, decreased respiratory rate. Why would that happen? Why won't they breathe? Well, maybe they have, uh, you know, sed sedation. They got sedation recently. That's why they're not breathing. That's why they are hypoventilating, right? When you hypoventilate, what happens to your CO2? You can't get rid of it, right? And therefore it builds up, right? So the CO2, the CO2 will go up, right? So we talk about obesity hypoventilation briefly. They got brain, they got strokes or CVAs. They have uh, the respiratory center of the brain is located where? Or in the brainstem or the pons and medulla, right? So they can, like, hypothyroid, thyroid's important for, it's like your on switch. It's going to, if it's not there, you're going to keep going to a hypothyroid crisis or myxedema coma, another way, name for it, okay? These are things where they, the rest rate starts going down and down and down, okay? And then compensation for metabolic alkalosis. This happens to us when we don't pay attention to the, um, the pH and what they're, what they should be living at, like a COPD patient, usually has a really, really high uh, bicarb at baseline. And then sometimes we, you know, we overcorrect it. And then they're like, well, shoot, I need to you know, stop breathing to make, to make myself better, right? So we'll talk more about that when we talk about uh, COPD, but they, uh, that's something that could, could happen, right? The other reason why I might get alkalotic is if we give too many diuretics, sometimes we, have, we start getting rid of potassium, we get, start getting hypokalemic. And if you know the association between potassium and, and pH, right? High pH is equal to low potassium, right? And high potassium is uh, equal to low pH, right? It's because of the, the shifting of through the cell, right? That's the way your body balances things. But if you are very, very alkalotic, how are you going to fix that? Your brain's like, well, I know how to fix that. I'm just going to raise the CO2, right? How do I raise the CO2? Slow down the respiratory rate. So that's, that's when we get patients too alkalotic, they can stop breathing and they fail their, their weaning trials to get off the ventilator. Okay, and then can't breathe. Too tight. The tidal volume is, is poor, right? Less than, what's a normal tidal volume? Who knows? About 400. Oh, 500 cc's is, is normal, right? That's a normal, adequate tidal volume, right? On the ventilator, that's different. We usually calculate it per kilo of ideal body weight, but you know, like a normal tidal volume right now, it should be about 500 cc's, right? It might be about 800 cc's, depending on your, on your size, but about 500 cc's. But it starts getting less and less because due to an upper airway obstruction due to obstructive sleep apnea overnight, right? That's why we usually put like BiPAP at night on our, our patients that are at risk, right? So asthma, COPD exacerbations, they can have bronchospasm that can make it difficult to get tidal volumes in or out, right? So usually COPD patients have trouble getting airway, their airways are obstructed, right? Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, they can't get the, the air out and therefore it's, the tidal volume is, can be poor. They can be foreign body, tumors, right? Dead space we talked about, anatomic dead space with, uh, they have, uh, we talked about this as rated, but also alveolar is what we talk about with uh, COPD. They can collapse their lower airways. They have, there's fibrotic lung disease. There's things that are getting in the way of our oxygenation, right? Vascular we mentioned is already, right? And then neuromuscular we touched on as well. Okay, so these are things that would cause a um, hypercapnia, 